In nomine Patricipiri Iget Spiritus Sancti. Amen. We have for today St. John Eudes, a French priest in the 1600s and instrumental in pioneering the feasts of the Sacred Heart of Jesus and of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Uh, two um, uh, great devotions in the church, and uh, we have here uh, one of the founders uh, of them. But we'll see um, that he wouldn't, uh, just like God likes to do this, he doesn't usually take any one particular saint to, to do something, to do a devotion, but they all build on each other. They all uh, support and advance um, the, the will of God. That's his way of showing that it's not in the individual saint who does it, but he himself. So uh, St. John Eudes was born in the year 1601. He was a very pious uh, young child. Received his first communion at age 13, and at age 14 took a private vow of chastity. And 10 years later, he was ordained a priest with the Oratorians of St. Philip Neri. Uh, so he, he served uh, the oratory very well. Uh, a severe plague broke out in 1627 and again in 1631, and he devoted his time uh, during both those years to caring for those who had been stricken with the disease. He administered the sacraments to them and ensured that, that the dead received a proper burial, uh, despite the fact that he himself uh, was very sick during this time, not from the plague, but from other, other ailments. Uh, but to avoid infecting his colleagues uh, with whom he lived, uh, because he was always around those who had the plague, he lived in a wine cask in the middle of a field. Uh, they used to make these wine casks that were capable of holding like uh, 15,000 gallons or something like that. So you actually could live in it. Uh, but it was not very, uh, it wasn't like a four-star restaurant or anything. It was pretty, pretty difficult. So he lived in this empty wine cask in a field while administering to those stricken with a plague. Uh, that is an example of priestly pastoral care. Uh, so um, he did this for uh, several years, and then um, when he recovered his, his health, he uh, began to travel around. He was a talented preacher, a very good confessor. So we went all over France uh, preaching missions and also seeking converts, because if we think this is in the, the 1630s, um, so this is right when the religious wars in Europe are, are tearing it apart. The Protestants and the Lutherans and the, the Huguenots and the Calvinists and all this, um, it, was, it was terrible for Europe. So he's preaching during this time and trying to, to make those converts uh, back from the heresy of Protestantism. Uh, he also uh, was quite concerned about the um, improving the spiritual condition of priests. If the priests are good, right, the people will, will follow suit. And he saw that the priests were not really receiving uh, good education. And so he began, he worked towards the founding of seminaries, which he did, uh, he founded actually several of them. Uh, were also worked on their education, their curriculum, and so on. Uh, very, very prodigious efforts by St. John Eudes. So he was, no, he was no stranger to hard work, uh, to effort, but there's an interesting interchange that took place between him and this, this pious woman in a city once. Um, in, in John's work, he was also helping these poor girls who were caught in a profession of ill repute and who wanted to leave that life behind, a life of prostitution, but there were there wasn't a very good shelter for them, like a, like a shelter house or a halfway house for these women uh, f fleeing that, that life of that evil life. Um, and John apparently was, he was doing, making some efforts, but apparently to this, this one woman, not enough. Uh, so she, she was a very pious woman herself, uh, but she said to him once, where are you off to now? Some church, I suppose, where you'll gaze at the images and think yourself pious. All the while, what is really needed is a decent house for these poor creatures. So rather, rather um, harsh words, uh, but they, they left an impact on St. John Eudes. And so he uh, worked harder and eventually found, ended up founding the Sisters of Charity of the Refuge, which is dedicated to helping women leave uh, that evil life. Eventually, um, that order he founded merged with the Sisters of the Good Shepherd, and they're still active today, and they work to help end uh, human trafficking. So we see that some, something somebody did 400 years ago is still having an effect today. Uh, and, and the lesson there for, for us, you know, with, with St. John Eudes is that he was not, like I said, no stranger to action, but there is a, a certain balance between the spiritual life and the active life. 
our prayer and our acts of personal piety and then our efforts uh, in, in uh, you know, um, um, taking care of uh, the needs of this life, shelter and, and, and clothing and, and housing and so on. And so it's not that we should leave behind those pious works and looking at statues and thinking we're pious, but taking that out elsewhere. Uh, the soul of the apostolate is prayer first, but then that needs to be followed by action. And so uh, our lesson there is rather the, the balance between the two. It's neither only prayer or, or only action, but both. Right? Even those cloistered uh, monks and nuns whose, whose job really is only prayer, it's all ordered towards action. Uh, that's why uh, St. Therese of Lisieux, who never left her monastery, is one of the patron saints of the missions, of evangelizing. Right? She never left, but she is considered one, one of the evangelizers uh, across the world because of her prayer. That is action. Uh, so this is, St. John Hughes is, is very active in all this, but his greatest contribution came in the form of, of his promotion, or really his uh, foundation, of the devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Immaculate Heart of Mary. These two devotions were, people had been praying to the, like, the Sacred Heart and the Immaculate Heart. There have been prayers to them. Uh, people knew about them, but they, they weren't like the devotions that we know today. They, they didn't formally exist yet. And so St. Uh, John Eudes, drawing upon the spirituality of uh, previous saints, uh, put them together. He composed a mass and an office for these two feast days, uh, the office, the matins, lauds, and, and so on. He came up with the hymns and the psalms to be read and so on. And the previous saints included St. Saint Gertrude the Great and St. Mechtilda. And these are both from the 13th century, and he read their works and he, and he built upon it, right? So it's not that... These saints invent devotions, but they read the Gospels, they read the saints who come before them, they think about it, they add their own, and then saints who come a couple hundred years later, they read that, and then they add their own understanding, and so on, and this is how the church is supposed to develop organically. Right? We take what came before, we take those seeds, and we build upon them. We don't throw them out and think that we've invented something new and better. We always build upon the past. Uh, and so what, what St. John Eudes would do with both of these hearts is he would not just come up with the, the uh, office and the feast day for them, but he would tie them together, which, which, which we're very familiar with today. But he had to develop that, right? It had to be developed explicitly. And here are his words on that, about the two hearts of the sacred and the immaculate heart. We must never separate what God has so perfectly united. So closely are Jesus and Mary bound up with each other that whoever sees Jesus sees Mary. Whoever loves Jesus loves Mary. Whoever has a devotion to Jesus has a devotion to Mary. Uh, that may sound familiar, but, but with a little different twist. Uh, St. Louis de Montfort is known for his Marian devotion, and he goes in the other direction. He says whoever sees Mary sees Jesus. Whoever loves Mary loves Jesus. To Jesus through Mary. That's Louis de Montfort, and here we have um, St. John Eudes coming from the other direction. I guess like meet in the middle. But that is how God works, right? He always, he, um, God is ultimately simple, and, and we, we look at, we're looking at two sides of the coin, right? You look at Jesus, you see Mary. You look at Mary, you see Jesus. That is how, that's the nature of God, right? And how he likes to do things is it's united, and it all, um, it doesn't matter what angle you look at it from, it's very consistent, and it all fits together. It's, it's like, a, like a tapestry um, with all these different, different saints and devotions working together. Um, and I guess an example of that is just, uh, so St. John Eudes would found the feast day for the Sacred Heart, but it wouldn't become popular until St. Margaret Mary Alaco about a hundred years later, um, uh, or just, just a few years later, rather a few decades, with the help of Claude de la Colombière. They would spread the devotion worldwide. She's called the Apostle of the Sacred Heart, but she was spreading the Mass that St. John Eudes composed. It's still celebrated today, at least in the traditional Latin Mass. Um, and he himself was, was uh, um, influenced by those previous saints. And then, um, so that was a Sacred Heart. The Immaculate Heart, which John Eudes would, would um, compose the Mass for, that was spread by Catherine Labour from France. And she was a nun with the Daughters of Charity. And that um, order was founded by St. Vincent de Paul. Right, so we, we see that they're all supporting each other. All these saints are all connected. And, and God, like I said, he does that on purpose because although he is very simple, ultimately simple, God is one, we are very divided. 
and you have a hundred different people in a room and they have a hundred different ways of looking at the same thing. And that's why we have all these different devotions. Because what makes sense to one person, it doesn't really affect another person very much. Uh, but with that other person, they're very, they're tremendously impacted by this other devotion over here. And so God has this, this, this like stained glass window of devotions he gives to the world because the world, all, the people are like this stained glass people, like every single one of us, the little piece, a little different shade, a little different color, and we need these different devotions. That's why every country has its own uh, different um, a Catholic heritage and way of, of, of praising God and expressing God and so on. But they're all united by a common thread of the past. You don't depart from the saints of previous centuries. You don't depart from what the church has said before. It's always the same. And that's how you have unity in diversity. And that's what the church has lost these days. It just wants to invent uh, anything but tradition. And then they're never going to find unity that way. So um, that's, that's why, I guess that would be why it's important for us to know this, to know the, the lives of the saints, to know these stories and these histories, which, which um, you know, the world calls legends and superstitions. And even those in the church are, are, will disbelieve the lives and legends of the saints, but that's our family history, right? And that informs us as to um, not just, okay, what, what does the Bible say, but how have people through the ages understood it? We need to understand it the same way. We're no different. Human nature doesn't change. The nature of man doesn't change. Our needs don't change. And so what was helpful and good for the people of the past are going to be helpful and good for us now, right? Within that context of all these, these different devotions. That's how it goes. So I would say it's, it's so important for us, right, to know these stories, know these saints, and to know their legends. And St. John knew that. That's, that St. John Eudes, that's how he was able to develop that devotion to the Sacred Heart, because he was reading saints from 300 years in the past and building upon them. Right? That's how he got this. Uh, so I would like for us to do the same. I'd like for us to, um, to follow St. John Eudes in that example. And he lived for 79 years, constantly working, writing, uh, uh, founding seminaries, helping poor women out of, out of their lives, you know, con making converts. Uh, he, he eventually died, you know, peacefully, 79 years old, working right up to the very end, right? That needs to be us, uh, working for Christ, believing in the saints of the past, believing in the legends, um, realizing that this is our family history, and if we're going to keep it alive, we have to know it, and we have to pass it on to f our future generations of Catholics, right? Th those, those children coming after us, they need to be taught, and, and, and if we don't teach them, who's going to do it, right? It's not going to be the world. So we need to know the lives of the saints, learn about them, and tell our children about them, uh, and teach them their prayers, their daily prayers and devotions. Uh, that's our task. Uh, we pray for the um, inspiration of St. John Eudes so that we might have his zeal in completing it. God bless you all. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.